Could you follow on a little bit from where Archbishop Shelley finished off yesterday? I was talking to him this morning, so he told me I'd also seen the conversation in Twitter last night as people were talking as you. The key thing that probably motivates the work of our office and that I know Archbishop Shelley would have spoken very strongly about yesterday is we're trying to help communicators, particularly Catholic communicators around the world, to reflect on what's changing in communications. And as Archbishop Shelley would have said very strongly yesterday, we're talking about a change not primarily in technologies, but in the culture of communication. As I saw uh, as the Twitter chat yesterday was very helpful to keep me. He mentioned that we don't use have media to evangelize. We have to engage and be present in a new type of conversation. We have to find an appropriate language in which to be present, and we have to understand what it means to be effectively part of the dialogue and the discussion and the debate that <coughs> constitutes the new culture of communication. And one of the things that I learned when I came here, I'm here about four years, and one of the things that I discovered was I came to the Vatican to work in the Vatican and to work in communications. And at the beginning, my focus tended to be very much on well, what happens in the Vatican in communication. And I discovered that there was the radio, which is quite independent of our office. There was a newspaper, independent of our office. There was a press office, which again, independent of our office. But what I discovered at the same time was that globally, there are extraordinary resources that constitute Catholic media or Catholic communications activities around the world. The thing we have above all else, and the most important resource we have, is an extraordinary network of people, of very talented communicators. Some people who have grown up with old media, so very specialized journalists, very good filmmakers, very good makers of radio. And then we have a younger generation who have grown up with digital media and who are very talented in thinking how the church should be present in the arena of digital media. And then somewhere in between, there's most of us who have a foot in both camp, don't fully belong in the new brave world, and still have certain skills that were valuable that we may have learned from older media. <coughs> and one of the things we've discovered as a council is that if we look around the world, and we, we're lucky, we get the chance to travel to, I'm just back from communications seminar organized by the Australian Bishops Conference. 200 people working in new media, talking about their experience of what it is to be a communicator, church communicator, in this new arena. Next week I go to the States for a seminar meeting. We've been to Africa to meet young communicators in East Africa who are trying to see how can we communicate effectively, in particularly in a part of the world that has known a lot of strife and conflict, how can we use the new forms of communications to rebuild community that has been shattered by war. So we're, we're lucky. We, we get to travel and to meet and to see what's happening globally. And one of the things we're interested in doing is trying to make of our council a kind of a, in English we use this expression, a clearing house. A clearing house is a kind of a shop that takes everything and sells everything. So we want to learn about and discover the things that are happening globally. What are the best things that are happening? What are the examples that are working in one language or in one culture that might actually work in another culture, although they may have to be translated? It's also important at times to know what doesn't work, so that if somebody spends a lot of time and effort on something and it doesn't work, well, share that learning with us because we're all learning together. So what we would like to do is make of our council is a clearinghouse, a place where we can encourage people to send us their stories, tell us what they're doing, invite us to come and join with them in reflecting on what they're doing, and then we try and make sure that that information, which is easy from a technical perspective, it's very easy to make that flow and make it available to a wider community, but it's now to try and create structures, community structures, that can reflect the kind of networks we have technically, that can create communications networks 
where people share and talk about and discuss what they're doing so that we can learn from each other. Because one thing <coughs> that's clear to me is that many of the best initiatives are not initiatives that are centrally planned. There are no gurus, there are no real experts. You can be lucky, you can be unlucky. But a lot of different initiatives we can learn what's working, what's not working. And one of the things I wanted to show to you is we've had to reimagine our institutional website. The, and this is our website here, it's pccs.va. We've reworked it recently and it's only beginning to take place. But what we want it to become is a kind of a shop window where people who are involved in communications in different parts of the world can let us know what they're doing. We can publish the information there and hopefully we can create a network of people who will learn what's happening, who will be able to learn from it, who will also be able to say, well, you know, maybe you could have done this. So it becomes a point of departure for a conversation. So as I say, our initiative at the moment is to develop this www.pccs.va as a clearinghouse. And for that to work, we need people who are working in the area of communications, Catholic and non-Catholic, Christian and non-Christian alike, to send us their information. We have the site in the various language groups, and our hope then is that it becomes a point of reference where people can say, I have a good idea, I think I'll be able to find an interested audience here, or I've seen something here, I'd like to learn more about it, and this can become a point of reference in which people learn together and from each other. One of the things we're hoping to open in this site is a forum, which will be not so much on the practical initiatives, but will focus a little bit more on the dialogue between theology and communications. And in order to launch that, next, the week after next, in um, San Francisco, or near to San Francisco, at Santa Clara University, we're having, we've invited a group of about 25 to 30 theologians and communication, communicators from the Christian churches generally to come together and think a little bit what can theology learn from communications and what can communications learn from theology. Very often you can have a theologian who writes a theology of communications or a communicator who wants to talk about how do we communicate theology. But we're more interested in getting a kind of a deeper discussion going about how have the new patterns and the new culture of communication changed our theological presuppositions? How as theologians do we reflect on the very <coughs> fact that our theology is itself an act of communications? So once we have this initial meeting, which is a two-day meeting engaging 25 real experts from around the world, we're opening up then on the site a forum which will be open to the public where people can go in and learn and talk and contribute to that discussion. So that's another little initiative. And as I say, we'd be interested in learning from you or hearing from you how we can work effectively so that we can promote a better awareness of what's good, what's helpful, and what maybe can support us in our work. So that's one project, our website, as a kind of an embodiment of our own desire to become this clearinghouse in the field of new media and of um, contemporary communications. A second initiative I want to talk about, and Archbishop Cherry has asked me to mention to you, is a website <coughs> we've developed recently called news.va, and there's an English version there as well, that's probably more useful to go over to, which is one of the things that we discovered in terms of, this is more an institutional Vatican-based platform, where what we wanted to do is, is people who wanted to find out what was happening in the Vatican, to know what the news is, what the Vatican is saying itself, traditionally found it difficult to access that information, because there are different websites, different languages being used, and different kind of materials that made it difficult for both journalists, professional journalists, and then for bloggers and for citizen journalists, or for believing journalists, who wanted to be in a position to engage with or to present church's teachings, church news, church questions. So this is a website we put together. We've tried to make it as attractive as possible. It takes the news from the radio, 
from the Vatican <laughs> newspaper, from the Vatican television, and presents it in an integrated, harmonious, stylistic form. It's also been done, we think, in a way that makes it easy to share. One of the things, we produce a lot of information. We can put it on a website. Will it go anywhere? It will only go anywhere if somebody likes it enough or is interested enough in it to share it with other people. So our whole philosophy here was to present news in formats that are easily shared. So you can tweet, you can use Facebook, and all the material is there for sharing or for embedding on a website or for embedding in a blog. It's to present the content that we're generating in a way that's easily accessible for people who are working with new media. And we've, been, we've had it almost a year. We still have beta on it because we're still learning what works, what doesn't work. We would hope very soon to have an application because we see that really, that's where the future is on something like this. We have particular challenges. One is because we're dealing with the global community. Our news frame here in the Vatican really goes from about 10 in the morning to about 8 in the evening. 8 in the evening is morning in Chicago. So if you're waking up in Chicago and you go to the website, it's not going to change for another 12 hours because everybody is effectively asleep here. And as you know, if you hit a website, there's nothing changing. You're not inclined to go back. So we've had to address some of the challenges on the, the fact that the church is such a large community. It's a global community. And then we have the linguistic challenges. So far, we've managed to take content that was traditionally only available in Italian we can make it available in English, French, and Spanish, and hopefully Portuguese very quickly. And that's our, one of our projects. One of the interesting things about this project is it was launched on the 29th of uh, June last year, and was launched by the Pope, who, for the first time ever, tweeted in order to launch this website. And that was an interesting exercise, because we got the Pope to tweet. And some people said, oh, it's a gimmick. It's not very serious. But what was interesting about that was we learned from people working in communications around the world saying, I've been trying to convince my bishop, or I've been trying to convince my superior that we should be involved in Twitter. He said no, now he's seen the Pope is doing it, I've got him, he's agreed with him. So one of the things we're interested in how you can use symbolically things coming out of here, even though we could not claim to be in the cutting edge or in the vanguard of communications, what we can do is sometimes give support to, symbolically, the work of people globally. So often, a lot of our work is about trying to encourage the people who are doing the communications, helping them to see that they're not on their own, and then trying to show that there is a support and appreciation for what they're doing here at the, kind of, more the center as well. A final project, and I'll just talk about it briefly, is every year, the Pope produces a message for World Communications Day. And over the last four or five years, the Pope has been reflecting a lot on what's changing in communications. One, he talked about how the new technologies are changing the way we form relationships. We also talked about how priests and ministers could use the new technologies to evangelize. We also looked at what it means to be a believer and present in social media? How do you witness to your faith in a way that is consistent with the dynamics of social media? This year we had a message was slightly different saying, good communications also requires the ability to listen. Silence is a fundamental dimension of communications, perhaps more important now than ever because we're constantly bombarded with information. Do we get time to reflect on it, to think about it, to engage with it, or are we simply managing information? But three years ago, we decided, in order to, publici to give publicity to the Pope's message for World Communications Day, to launch a dedicated website called PopeTU.net. It was our first new media initiative in terms of exclusively new media initiatives. We'd had Va Vatican websites, etc. But this was something we did. The message was about new technologies, new forms of relationships. We said, let's use a website to promote the message rather than simply posting out a written, paper-bound message as we would traditionally have done. And it, it was a humble thing. We gave it a short amount of time. We invested very little money on it. We got five million hits in the first week of operation. And more than anything else, 
that help to persuade people internally that there is a value and a worth in new media. But this can be a very effective way of reaching people and of communicating people with people who may not come into our churches or who may not read papal messages but were somewhat intrigued by this initiative and therefore followed with it. Since that, we've tried to keep it alive by periodically using the website as a kind of platform for trial and error, for seeing what might work, what might be effective. So we're doing something ourselves hands-on so we can learn something about better about the dynamics of new media. This year for Lent, we decided the Pope publishes a message for Lent every year. It's a six or seven page message. It gets a certain amount of attention, but this year we said, let's take 40 quotations, turn them into 40 tweets, and send a tweet a day, so that communicating the message over the 40 days of Lent, one short message at a time. And we launched this campaign through Twitter. We had 30,000 people who signed up to receive a tweet every day, and we know that many of those people in turn retweet it. So we can say with a certain certainty that the Pope's message for Lent this year had a more immediate and direct impact on a people who maybe traditionally would never be aware of that message. I'll leave you with one funny thing about the dynamics of new media. Is when we came to launch this year's Twitter campaign, we discovered that as often happens, all the best Twitter handles were gone. So you couldn't find a decent... So we ended up having to take Pope to you Vatican, which is not an easy, and John Stewart, the American comedian on the Comedy Channel, made a great joke about this, and he came on pretending to the Pope and saying, I want Benedict, it's gone, I want Pope, it's gone, I'm stuck with this, and he gets all annoyed. And it was not intended to be kind, and it was a little, was, was accurate, but it was quite critical of our bad handle, but the good news is, 7,000 new people signed up within about three hours to the OTU <laughs> uh, Twitter channel. So no news is bad news in this world. And that. So look, that's just some of our insights on the more practical side, complimenting Archbishop Shelley. Again, our, our main interest and in our discussion with you is to try and understand this new culture so we can be more effectively present. Thank you. Thank you.